Hi, welcome to our 40 day journey, a new life. Um, today is day 19, so we're gradually getting there, and it is so exciting coming back um, to chat with you about this amazing book that we've been looking at The Purpose Driven Life. And it says, What on earth am I here for? and it's by Rick Warren. It's one of those best-selling non-fiction hardback book in history, it says. But it's one of those books that I absolutely love and that's why I'm sharing it with you. And as usual, we encourage you to chat with us. Um, tell us what you're experiencing so far on this journey. Uh, because our dream, our hope for this journey is such that if we, once we finish with the with, with this book, we're hoping that we definitely have a new life in our, in our, it's all about the mind. What have we put in our mind? And once our mind is on the right track, things start to happen for us. And that's why I called it a new life. Because the dream is, once we finish this book, we will have a different attitude to life. We will have a different way we see life. And some people like to call it a renewed life or some people call it being born again. Being born again means you now see things completely differently. So that's why this book, and um, like I always say, I've, I've read so many books, we're, we're, we're gonna get into that. I have quite a few interesting things I wanna show you today. Okay, so chapter 19 um, says cultivating community. Again, I, I want you to remember to share this with as many of your friends as possible. Because while I'm excited sharing this with you, and I know not many people are picking up on it yet, because we are not really in this mode of advertising it and letting everybody know that we're doing something like this. I know that when it's all done, um, especially the YouTube which is there, sitting down there waiting for you whenever you're ready, it's going to be a big hit when the time is done. I know that for sure. Anyway, so cultivating community is chapter 19. And develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results. Only if, we, if you do the hard of getting along each, with each other. Treating each other with dignity and honor. That's it. If we can live with each other and treat each other with dignity and honor. And this is James chapter 3 verse 18. Then it goes further, it says, They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. And this is out of the apostles chapter 2 verse 42. So this usually gives us two quotes or two passages from the Bible, and that's the two. And now we're going to delve into this com cultivating community. That's what we're looking at today. So community requires commitment. Only the Holy Spirit can create real fellowship. Real fellowship believers. But he cultivates it with the choices and commitments we make. Paul points out this dual responsibility by saying, you are joined together with peace through the Spirit. So make every effort to continue together this way. You are joined together with peace through the Spirit. So make every effort to continue together in this way. It takes both God's power and our effort to produce a loving Christian community. Unfortunately, many people grow up in families with unhealthy relationships. So they lack the re relational skills needed for real relationship. And so we're just, again, looking at relationships and community. So it says, unfortunately, most of us grow up in families with unhealthy relationships. And so people like that lack the relational skills needed for real relationship. They must be taught how to get along with and to others in God's family. How to get along with others in God's family. So he's explaining it. Cultivating community takes honesty. That's the big message. It takes honesty. 
you have to care enough to lovingly speak the, the truth rather than gloss over a problem or ignore an issue. So now you are in a community. You are in relationship with other people. He says it takes a lot. It takes a lot to be in a position to speak the truth. And he calls it loving. Lovingly speak the truth. It is easier to remain silent when others around us are harming themselves or harming others. So remember, we're just taking it forward from the last chapter where we were still talking about community and real fellowship. So when you're in this group, how do you operate? And I remember when we, he talked so much about the church, you can, you can transpose that into any relationship you have or any community that you have. So he's now trying to explain to us what it's like to actually grow in a community. And so you have to care enough. You have to care enough in this group to lovingly speak the truth to your, yourselves rather than gloss over a problem. Because there will always be problems problem once people are staying together long enough. And when these problems come, be lovingly enough to speak the truth. That it's easier to gloss over the problem and pretend it's not happening. Stay silent and allow people to harm themselves. Says most, most people have no one in their lives who loves them enough to tell them the truth, even when it's painful. So they continue in self-destructive ways. And, and this was one of those issues, I think I mentioned it in one of the chapters where we had the experience of Michael Jackson. This was a huge star. And I remember watching an interview after he died and one of his best friends said, Michael Jackson was an extremely lonely person. I mean, outsiders like us would be wondering, are you joking? This guy had everybody at the, his beck and call. Whatever he wanted, people were there ready to do it. But being close enough that you can tell that person the truth, even when they don't want to hear it. That's what he's referring to here. So he says most people have no one in their lives. So there may be huge stars and celebrities and whatever they are, but you may find that they really don't have anyone they can really confide in. And that's what we're talking about, this relationship and community here. So often we know what needs to be said to someone, but our fears prevent us from saying anything. So you might have friends, you might have family members, you might have, you know, distant relatives, Wherever these people are that create the community that you are in, you will know what the truth is. But you are afraid of saying it. Most fellowships have been sabotaged by fear. So much friendships, much communities have been sabotaged by fear. No one had the courage to speak up while a member was falling apart. Sometimes you're in a group and people are too afraid to say say it as it is because they don't want to be the one that was strong enough to speak the truth says the bible tells us to speak the truth in love when you are in a relationship be strong enough to tell the truth and solomon said an honest answer is a sign of true friendship an honest answer this happens a lot to people and that's why most times you hear people say Oh, fame got to him or fame got to her. Because the many people start getting into that position where they think, oh yeah, everybody's knowing me. They suddenly allow it to get it to get into their head. And what then happens is they don't want to hear anybody else tell them the truth anymore. Because they think they've grown so big that they're beyond being told the truth. And I remember listening to an interview Beyonce gave once. And she said, um, she went out with her mom after the, their first album had gone out. And she was in the shop and she was shopping and she was just singing. She, I think she had her earphone on and her mom was talking to her. And she wasn't listening because in her head she thought, I'm such a huge star now, who can talk to me? And she said her mom just gave her a good slap on her face. And that brought her back to life. Because she actually thought that she had outgrown everyone. And when they got home, the mom, told, the mom told her, I don't care 
what star dumb you think you've got i don't care whatever you're gonna get to in life you're still my daughter and when i speak you listen and she says since then she came back to earth i mean we can all see how much of a huge celebrity she is and how much of a huge star she is because she listened because she allowed people around her to speak to her and tell her the truth and this is something lots of us really really suffer from because we don't want to hear anybody else talk to us for the fact that we think we are up there Solomon is saying to us an honest answer is a sign of true friendship thank you so much someone just said to us um oh from New Jersey hey, welcome on board we're so excited to have you here um again share this with your friends because this is one of those messages that will really really you know inspire you and change the way you see life um because it's, it's been quite a big journey for me we'll get there we'll get there but please stay on because i hear sometimes people just come in and go and come in and go you may not get the true picture if you just come and go and apart from that just go back on youtube if you find you've missed any part youtube's got everything we're recording it for youtube okay so this means caring enough to lovingly confront one who is sinning or is being tempted to sin so telling this truth and being honest with people is just being in that position where you can tell people this is what is going on because most times when people are in this position they don't even know what they're doing anymore paul says brothers and sisters if someone in your group does something wrong you who are spiritual should go to that person and gently help make him right again so again he's speaking on being in the church and the community in the church remember he said it's best we have groups of communities of maybe 10 and jesus had 12 that he could really open heart to heart to and be genuine with them and he says we should stop being having relationships that are fake and, and unnatural so now Paul is saying, brothers and sisters, if someone in your group, so if you have this little group that makes up who you are, that you can be honest and genuine with, if someone in there is doing something wrong, it is your role. Because you're spiritual enough to see it, to just call them back, gently bring them back. Many fellowships and small groups remain superficial because they are afraid of conflict. So you see, when you have this small group and you cannot tell your brother or your sister where they're going wrong, you are being superficial. And that's because you're too scared to be honest with them. So everyone lives with an underlying frustration. So when you're in this group and you cannot tell it as it is, deeper inside you, you're frustrated. Everyone knows about the problem, but no one talks about it openly. It creates a sick environment of secrets where gossip thrives. Paul's solution was straightforward. No more lies, no more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other after all. So when you're in this group, and this, this time that he's referring to is Paul and Peter and all the you know disciples of God, uh, Christ, we're all there struggling to make ends meet to bring the church together after jesus had passed and then this was a difficult time for them and they were coping to to stay spiritually strong and so they had to find a way to deal with things and this is one of the times when paul was now saying no more lies no more pretense they should learn to tell their neighbor the truth in christ's body we are all connected to each other after all so when you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. Now, I am actually seeing this whole thing as today's living. Because this may have been referring to the time of Christ and after Jesus died, and then the apostles were struggling to make ends meet. That's just, that's not all this book is about. It's about us in the present times. It's about us in our little communities. It's about us in the friendships that we have. If we cannot be honest with each other and share the truth when there's need for it, we, have been, we end up being frustrated most of the time. 
It's a real fellowship, whether in marriage. See, now he's beginning to open it wider. Real fellowship, whether in marriage, friendship, or in church, depends on frankness. Absolutely love this. Real fellowship, whether in marriage, friendship, or church, depends on frankness. So he's mentioning marriage now. Marriage, friendship, sisters, brothers, parents and children, whatever this relationship is. Remember, none of us can survive in isolation. So we're always relating to somebody. He said the real meaning of this friendship or relationship comes from frankness. Until you care enough to confront and resolve the underlying barriers, you will never grow close to each other. This is awesome. This is awesome. Because these are some of the reasons I had to find a solution to my struggles. We're going to get there, but I am telling you, this chapter is one of those chapters that really, really blew my mind. We're dealing with relationships in life. We're struggling to understand each other. And he's reminding us, until you care enough to confront and resolve the underlying barriers. So we're constantly having issues to deal with. Remember, life is a test. And so no matter how amazing you think you are, you are definitely going to come across issues in life that hold you back. And if you cannot open up with each other and share whatever these barriers are, he says, there's never going to be closeness. You're never going to find yourself close enough to each other. And so when conflict is handled correctly, we grow closer to each other by facing and resolving our differences. And we, we know what this means in real life times. We know when you're in relationships and things are not working out right. We know what it does to us. That's why I'm so excited about this chapter because by the time we're done with it, so many things are going to open up to you. You're going to look around you and go, wow. It's for you to start understanding the relationships you have. How you can handle the issues that come your way. And he's telling us that when conflict is not handled correctly, we end up, when conflict is handled correctly, we grow closer to each other. So when we handle conflicts that will come in every relationship better, we end up growing closer. And then we cannot resolve differences and face whatever is coming in our life. So the Bible says in the end, people appreciate frankness more than flattery. You find that there are people who would rather be flattered who, when they ask you a question, you duck and dive and you find an answer they want to hear and you just give it to them. There are people who love that. But at the end of it all, people would rather if you were genuine with them, if you were honest with them, if you had told them the truth, rather than being so fake and so flattery. So frankness is not a license to say anything you want, whenever you want and wherever you want. Again, it could go overboard. There are people who just have no control in their mouth. And so when they talk, they just throw out whatever's in there. I mean, I did attend an event once, it was about dementia. And I got to understand there are, there are conditions like that, where apparently there's something in the brain that helps to, when we, we are confronted with issues, we think about it. And we say the right and wrong in it before we say what we think about. But these people, that part of their brain is not there. And so whatever they, whatever comes in their mind comes right out. And one of the ladies who presented the topic was, was telling us an instance where she was working in this place with these people. And she said, this, this man, the minute you walk in, he just tells you what he can see. Oh, you've grown so fat today. Oh, you know, ridiculous things that you would just want to just hide and say, what is going on here? But because they were working there and they understood what his condition was, 
it was nothing to them. But people like that, you know, children are like that sometimes too. They just tell you as it is. They don't care how you feel. But now he's saying, in the end, um, frankness is not a license for you to just say anything you want to people whenever you want it and wherever you want it. So we must guard it a little bit. It is not rudeness. So frank, frankness is not rudeness. Just because you're meant to be frank and honest with people doesn't mean you have to dream up how rude you can be and break people. Bible says there is a right time and the right way to do everything. This is one of those chapters I think in Ecclesiastes where he's saying there's a time for everything. So maybe if you have to tell somebody something, it doesn't have to be in the open. You could call them into a corner. You could, if you know you really can face up to them today, you could scribble it in a note. But if it bothers your conscience so much, yes, to tell them as it is, look for a way to put it without deliberately hurting them. Thoughtless words leave lasting wounds. You hear that? That's why I said without deliberately hurting them. Because sometimes, I mean, I've, I've heard people say words. The thing with words is you can't take them back. So once you said something that really hurt somebody, sometimes it remains in their conscience forever. They, they always remembered, but was it not you that said so and so to me? So words can be really, really hurtful. So he says, God tells us to speak to each other as loving family members. So when we're chatting with people, we should learn to speak with them as loving family members. Never use harsh words. And further in the chapter, he went to explain that um, when you're speaking to old people, you should think of them like your dad. When you're speaking to women, you should think of them as your sister or your mother. And so when you start breaking it down like that, you will not see yourself being extremely rude to people. So sadly, thousands of fellowships have been destroyed by lack of honesty. So when you're in friendship or, rela or relationship, well, thank you so much. Someone just sent us a message saying, thanks for sharing. Thank you. We're glad that you are there. We're glad that you're there listening because this is something we really love um, sharing with you. Um, it's an experience that I have been going through and I thought it's best I share it. Because it's, it's so important that we clean our head before we can really think of taking on life. Life is extremely work, it is work. And going from this book, one of the best things he's ever taught me is life is a test. Because lots of us just take so many things for granted. It is a test. And as he says, sadly thousands of fellowships have been destroyed by lack of honesty. And what I keep reminding myself is, when he says fellowship or community or relationship, take it to whatever level. Take it to your best friend. Take it to your husband. Take it to your wife. Take it to your children. This is what relationship is all about. And if you are in a relationship with anybody, and you cannot be honest with them, these are the things that are destroying the relationship. And so he's saying thousands of fellowships have been destroyed by lack of honesty. This is extremely true because that's what's happening out there. We have friendship that we cannot be honest with each other. We have, you know, families that don't talk to each other because they cannot be genuine with each other. And Paul wrote, you must not simplify, you must not simply look the other way and hope it goes away on its own. So that's what happens. Most people are frustrated in relationships. Most people are distraught. Most, most people are sad and they are unhappy. But what's going on? We think we can just look the other way and pretend it's not happening. And Paul has said, you cannot simply do that. Because if you do that, you're not being genuine. And it just will end nowhere. Better devastation and embarrassment than damnation. You, you, you're better off being devastated after you tell somebody the way it is, or you're better off being embarrassed telling somebody the way it is than waiting to be damned forever because you never spoke up when you needed to. He said you pass it off as a small thing, but it's anything but that.
it's not that small when issues come up in life take them on look at them deal with them is that you shouldn't act as if everything is just fine when one of your companion is promiscuous or crooked and again now he's closing it in on the community in church when people members of this church are promiscuous or cro crooked and mostly in big gatherings or big communities you start seeing things like people are struggling to manage the finances and i i know that one for sure like the churches in africa in nigeria in particular where i come from you see people contribute whatever amount of money they're expected to contribute you hear about tithes you hear about putting the money in church and oh god gives a cheerful leader leader uh giver god god gives a you know, god loves a cheerful give up and so you give and give and give and then in the church there's no accountability nobody accounts for the money that's been put in church and then you see the, the the leader of the church riding with a jet traveling the world and they see billions of or, 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 or millions of dollars in his house and that's a church and so when he's explaining here that you know, in the church, they are finding out that there's promiscuity, there's crookedness, there's flipping with God, there's being rude to friends, and they're getting drunk or becoming greedy and predatory. These are things that you shouldn't just shut your mouth about if you find yourself in such communities. And this cuts across everything we do in life. So whatever relationship you're having, whatever community you're in, and you're finding things like this happening, it's not for you to pretend it's going to go away. It's for you to face them head on. So you can't just go along with it. Treating it as acceptable behavior. I'm not responsible for what the outsiders do, but don't we have some responsibility for those within our community? So if you find that your community is going completely out of hand, our role now is to get involved. Get to find out what's going on. See how we can help ourselves to create a better community. And Paul wrote again, wrote this to the Corinthians. And that was the passage that just finished. He was explaining all the things that's possible. Because they had their, they had this passive code of silence in allowing immorality to exist in the community. I remember the community we're talking about here is any community you find yourself in. So here is explaining again, cultivating community takes humility. So for you to, to be part of an exciting community, a living community, a community that supports your personal growth, it says it takes a lot of humility. Self-importance, smugness, and stubborn pride destroys fellowship. Any friendship, any relationship, and you know humble enough to allow it to grow. It says, self-importance, you put yourself in this pedestal and you think you're better than everybody else. And you carry this smugness around you and you think you are a better person. And you're stubborn. You got so much pride. All of these things destroy relationship and friendship. So pride builds and um, builds. It builds walls between people. That's what pride does. It builds walls, walls between people. And humility builds bridges. So when people are humble, there's a bridge that you create that brings you people together. But when people are arrogant and very, very proud, what they end up having is a big wall that the other person cannot cross. Humility is the oil that smooths and suits relationships. So when you're humble, you suit your relationship, you oil it, you make it work. The Bible says, clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Why? Because humility is the one that's actually going to help create a bridge. Bible says, clothe yourself with humility towards one another. And the proper dress for fellowship is a humble attitude so when you're humble to people 
you give them an opportunity to be your friend. You give them an opportunity for both of you to coexist. And the passage that where he was saying, clothe yourself with humility towards one another continued. Because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So this is what God sees in us. He sees the humble as great people. Well, the arrogant, proud person. There's a song I know I say, He that is down needs fear no fall. And he that is low has no pride. And he that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. So whenever you're humble, God raises you. But when you're arrogant and proud, you're brought down to earth. And so, Pride plus God's grace in our lives, which we must have in order to grow. So you see that? It says pride will block God's grace in your life. We must have this grace in order for us to grow. So do we want to lose God's grace? Change, heal and help others. So that's the message we really should learn to change our arrogant attitudes in life or in communities or in relationships we should learn to be humble we receive god's grace by humbly admitting that we need it we should come to god humbly and say we need your grace hear us be with us the bible says anytime we are prideful we are living in opposition to god that is a foolish and dangerous way to live. So when we amass pride unto ourselves, we are actually losing out. We are foolish and we have a dangerous way of looking at life. We can develop humility in special ways by admitting our weaknesses. So when you're in any relationship, husband and wife, friends and friends, um, parents and children, relatives, be honest enough with each other. Admit your weakness. Tell the other person, this is where I'm weak. And on this one, I think I'm strong enough to handle things. You have to be patient with each other. By being open to correctness. So if you find whatever it is you're doing is not right. Or you've done it and somebody says to you, you know what? That thing you did wasn't the right thing to do. Be open, be willing to learn. Because what changes is when people are arrogant and proud and they don't want to hear anybody tell them anything. You heard the story of Beyonce, she was willing to listen to her mother. And it's got her today, where she is. If she was one of those people who didn't want to hear, and I know so many people like that who never wanted to hear anybody tell them anything again. It didn't leave them anywhere. So by, by pointing the spotlight on others, Paul advised, live in harmony with each other. Don't try to act important, but enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Don't think you know it all. Big message is coming out of this chapter. It says, don't try to act important, but enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. This is something lots of us take for granted. We carry ourselves across the world thinking that, oh yeah, we own the world. That's not what we should be doing. To Christians in Philippi, he wrote, give more honor to others than to yourself. Do not be interested only in your own life. And there's so many of us out there who are extremely self-centered. We don't want to hear about anyone else. We don't want to think about anyone else. Be interested in the life of others. Others, Be willing to support others. Be willing to give to others. Come out of your self-centeredness. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Now that's something to think about. It's not thinking less of yourself. So you're not sitting there and saying, Oh, I'm actually, I'm absolutely so useless. Because there are people like that who think nothing good of themselves. 
they think they're so low, low down there. That's not what he's saying. That's not humility. Humility is thinking less. So what that means is, it's not every minute, every thought that comes to your head is all about you. It's not just you. Your life is not only about you. It's about other people as well. So sitting down here and doing this program with you, I am considering you to sit here and spend the time and do all this reading and put on all this equipment so I can share this message with you. That's humility. Thinking more about you than just about me. So he explained it. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. So you're not thinking, oh yeah, I'm lonely. I'm not anybody. I'm not existing at all. But thinking, you're thinking of yourself less. Not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less is something that you really need to sit down and, and grapple with and say, wow, not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Humility is thinking more of others. So people out there that need your support, like we took on this training of sharing our skill with people across the world which is the our home training pack um this got over 30 dvds in it we have skills here over 21 plus all the ones that guide you to set up your business in here and i remember when i started this when this whole when my training in here started and we got messages from all over the world and people are saying we would have loved to do this but you're too far away from us um we're considering the cost of traveling we're considering staying in the hotel we're considering leaving our family what can we do to get what you are sharing with us and we had to come up with that we had to come up we had to go put together the whole program we were thinking more about you because like I said to people who call me here and talk about training, I already have this skill. It is in my hands already. I can do things with it, which I do. But I don't want to keep it just to me. So I'm not thinking about me now, I'm thinking about you. I want to share this with people. I want people to sit in their home and be able to achieve the skills that I have. That's thinking about you. That's humility. So that's the same message I want you to take on in whatever you are doing. So whatever you have in your hands, which is part of the message this man is giving us as well, is we've all been created with something. Whatever it is that God gave you to share with the world. Because the two major things he gave us there was life is a trust and life is a test. Test is us going through all the regular problems of the world and we're meant to overcome, we'll go further down in there. But trust is God giving you something to share with the world. And are you sharing it? This is one big place where I need people to wake up. Are you sharing that big skill, that big talent, that big knowledge in your hand? Are you sharing it with the world? So that's where we are here. Humility is not thinking is thinking more of others. Humble people are so focused on serving others, they don't think of themselves. I could have just packed up and just focused on giving my skill to my clients and not be interested in anybody else. But no, I chose not to do that. I chose to give it to the rest of the world and help you to achieve the same thing I have achieved with her. So cultivating community takes courtesy. Remember we just said humility, I mean um, cultivating communities about humility. Here we're looking at cultivating community takes courtesy. Courtesy is respecting other, um, respecting our differences. Now this is a really big one because there is no two human beings in the world that are exactly the same. Not even twins, not even co-joined twins, not triplets. I've seen so many twins and triplets and I just sit and I look at them and you can just tell. Either the personality is different or the attitude is different. Everything is different because that's the way God created us. 